שלום להברים שלנו בישראל, שמי יעקב פרס, ואנחנו לומדים את התנ״ך בקשר עם השוב של האדון יהושע, אדוננו. Talk to my friends in Israel, to send some Israel is awesome. Okay. Eight things pre-tribulationists do not wish to discuss. Eight things that our pre-tribulational brethren, friends, family, pastors, do not wish to discuss. Quite a thing. You know, when Jehovah's Witnesses don't want to discuss their false predictions about the world ending in 1914, 1915, 1927, 1968, 1975, etc., the JWs don't like to talk about that stuff. The Mormons don't like to talk about Joseph Smith and the Brigham Young had 22 wives and all. They don't like to talk about that stuff. It's difficult subjects. With Muslims, you know, you don't, they don't like to talk about that Muhammad married Aisha when she was six and took her virginity when she was nine. He was 54. Your prophet is what civilized, what we'll call a pedophile. They don't like to talk about that. Uh, I had some Muslims really angry at me in England, and they said, well, her, fa her father approved of it. He said, what kind of a father would approve of a little girl getting... <laughs> well... They don't like to talk about it. The Roman Catholic Church doesn't like to talk about the Spanish Inquisition. I mean, they don't like to talk about it. Now, when other religions, false religions, cults, don't want to talk about things, I expect it. <laughs> I expect it. But if I'm witnessing to a Jehovah's Witness, sharing my faith with a Jehovah's Witness, you know, they're trained to change the subject when you nail them on something. And there's two of them, they're spying on each other. Well, I, I'll talk about the Trinity after this. Can we talk about why you're following people who predict things that don't happen? Proven false prophets. Let's talk about this. You know, I talked to the Muslim. I said, wait a minute now. Look, um, the Koran says that Miriam, the mother of Jesus, Mary, and Miriam, the sister of Moses, is the same woman, and they lived at least 1,300 years apart. Can you explain this to me? <laughs> you know, I don't let them off the hook, you know, and <laughs> they can deal with the issue, you know what I mean? Well, but they're non-believers. They're people you're trying to share your faith with. And they have an agenda, and they're protective of their belief system because you're threatening their false sense of security, you expect non-believers to behave this way in evangelism and apologetics. You expect them. I do it with the rabbis all the time. I, you know, Daniel 9 says the Messiah had to come and die before the second temple would be destroyed. What are you going to do with it, rabbi? They don't like to talk about it. It says in the Talmud there's a curse on reading Daniel 9. <laughs> Ah, they don't want to deal with it. Okay, I can handle that from rabbis or Jehovah's Witnesses. I can handle it from the Roman Church. I can handle it from cults or Muslims. I can handle it. But when my brethren in Christ don't want to deal with fundamental issues that are not only pertinent but foundational to what they're trying to convince me to believe, there's a problem. Don't read the fine print. Just sign the contract. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'll sign anything you want as long as you add one clause. Subject to the approval of my attorney. <laughs> and so it goes. The first thing they don't like to discuss. The 20th century academic patriarch of pre-tribulationism was indisputably the former president of Dallas Seminary, John Wolvert. True believer, good man, said and did good things. Wrote things I agree with. Many things. I'm not attacking him in any way personally. But one of his virtues was he did have a sense of academic integrity. When he got something wrong, he would say it. 
And most of this pre-tribulationism in the United States has had its academic source in Dallas Seminary. That was the wellspring from where most of it permeated other seminaries and theological thinking among pastors. Dallas. The president of Dallas Seminary, who wrote a book on the rapture, Dr. Wolvert, a man whose legacy I respect, he's now with the Lord, wrote and stated, <coughs> there is no passage in scripture, no passage anywhere in scripture that overtly teaches a pre-tribulational rapture. It is something we glean by way of overview. They don't like to talk about their patriarch, their academic kingpin, their academic, their scholarly mentor of pre-tribulational theological thinking. There's no passage that teaches it overtly. It's an opinion you have to glean from an overview of other scripture. How can you be dogmatic about something never overtly stated? Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I can be dogmatic about that, okay? Without holiness, no man shall see God. We can be dogmatic about that. I can be dogmatic about that, okay? Flee youthful lusts. I can be dogmatic about that. I can be dogmatic about that. I can be dogmatic about anything the word of God plainly states. But on what basis can you be dogmatic about something that amounts to an opinion? Now we've talked about this before. You can have an opinion. There are two words for opinion. One is dikeomai, also meaning rights, like Laodicea, Laodikeomai, people's rights to their opinion and thinking. Laodicea runs on people's ideas. We have a book, uh, The Dilemma of Laodicea. Paul writes of opinion in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7. And if you look at what he says, how careful he is. Not I, but the Lord. The Lord, not I. Not I, but the Lord. This is an apostle who saw Jesus, who got his doctrine directly from Jesus Christ. Look how Paul deals with sanctified opinion in 1 Corinthians 7. Verse 6, but this I say by way of concession, not of command. Verse 8, but I say to the unmarried and to widows. Okay. Verse 10, however, but to the married, I give instruction. Not I, but the Lord. Verse 12, but to the rest, I say, not the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, thus thinketh Paul. And he continues. He continues like this throughout the entire, what we would call chapter, no chapter divisions in the original canon, of course. Verse 25, now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord. I give an opinion. Is there a place for sanctified opinion? Yes. Is it a basis for doctrine? No. Now, I do believe it's canonical. I do believe the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write that. But the doctrine it teaches is you can't make a doctrine on opinion. <laughs> The doctrine it teaches is you can't make a doctrine on opinion. Yes, it's canonical. 
But you can't make a doctrine on opinion. That's what it's teaching, dogmatically. Um, now, it's good, solid pastoral advice. It's good, solid apostolic advice. When a man of God, of proven report like Paul, writes something, we should give careful weight to his counsel. But even Paul, an apostle who saw Jesus and got his doctrine directly from the Lord and is being directly inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the scripture. This is my view, but the Lord says this. I think this, but this is what God says. Notice how cautious he is to draw the distinction. You can have an opinion, but you can only base a doctrine on something overtly stated. Exegesis, not asegesis. Exegesis is taking out of the text something it says. Asegesis is reading something into the text it does not say. Now, it may be right. There's things I have an opinion about. I may be right, I may be wrong. I've said this before, I think I said it once here in Fellowship Bible Chapel some years ago. I am of the view that although the main battle of Gog and Magog must be the one at the end of the millennium because that's the one stated in the New Testament, I'm of the view that there may be two battles of Gog and Magog, one before the millennium and one at the end. I think there could be two. I may be right, I may be wrong, but it's my opinion. If you have a different view, I'm not going to argue with you. Maybe you've got it right, maybe I've got it wrong. It seems to me there could be two. And the main one must be the one the New Testament states because we interpret the Old Testament in light of the New Testament revelation of Christ. Now, if you don't agree with me, you think there's only one at the end of the millennium? Okay, fair enough. There's no basis for division. I can't be dogmatic. My opinion. Hopefully sanctified opinion. But only my opinion. It is the height of arrogance to elevate your opinion to the status of dogma. Cults do this. The Roman papacy does this with their encyclicals. Talmudic Judaism does this. False religions do this. Children of God ought not. If a pre-trib rapture is your persuasion, if it is your opinion, that's one thing. But your patriarch, your academic kingpin, states there is no single passage of scripture that overtly states it. Tell me, J.D. Farrig, tell me. Dr. Wolford couldn't find it. He was pre-trib, but he said it's not in there. He couldn't find it. Can you tell me where it is? Why are you saying that people who don't agree with you are satanic? That's what they say. That's exact terminology. To say something is demonic is, is very serious. To say it's satanic. Oh my Lord. Dr. Wolverd. Deal with it. Your academic patriarch says it's not in there. 
It has to be gleaned. This is admitted. My late friend Dave Hunt, who I loved, I loved him. I loved that man. He was succeeded by Tom McMahon, who I always got along with. T.A. McMahon says, this is what he said. He was with Thomas Ice and he stated the following. We don't just base doctrine on what's literally stated. We base doctrine on extrapolation. For instance, the Trinity is not stated, but we believe it, we extrapolate it. Huh? What John 14, John 17 is not in your Bible? The martyrdom of Stephen, Jesus at the right hand of the Father, that he's filled with the Spirit, is not in your Bible. What do you mean it has to be extrapolated? Now, I grant you that there are texts from which it can be extrapolated, but there are also texts that directly reveal the triunity of the Godhead. A Jehovah's Witness would be doing somersaults. They'd be dancing in celebration if they heard what T.A. McMahon said about the Trinity. And why does he say something so reckless and irresponsible? To support pre-tribulationism. To go to that length? To support something that they admit is not in there? And then to make it a doctrine. They don't like to talk about this. Why couldn't Dr. Wolverd find it? It's an opinion. You gleaned it from other scriptures. But look, Paul wouldn't make a doctrine of opinion. He was an apostle. He got his doctrine directly from Christ. They don't like to talk about that. Let's look at the second thing, our pre-tribulational friends and brethren do not like to discuss. They just don't like to talk about this. There are arguments with pre-tribulationism in the early church, they try to argue yes, Opponents of it argue that it came from someone called Lacunza and Elizabeth McDonald with, in the Irvingites, and Darby got it from them at the power court conferences, and his father was denied it. But they have to protect Darby and, in this country, Schofield. They must protect the legacy of John Nelson Darby and of Cyrus Schofield. J. N. Darby. and Cyrus Schofield. American protege. Let's begin with Darby. Darby, according to Charles Spurgeon, Darby, According to George Mueller, you know who George Mueller was? Darby, according to many of the early brethren, such as Benjamin Newton, was a cult leader and a false teacher. Charles Spurgeon took out full-page ads in newspapers in England, publicly warning against Darby saying what he was doing was cultic. That cult still exists. They're called the Closed Brethren. We have them in Britain, and there are elements of it in the USA, Canada, Australia, New Zealand mainly. About 40,000 of them. They destroy families. They destroy marriages. Total party spirit. And their leaders were publicly exposed as immoral men, drunks and all sorts. Jim Taylor and these guys, there were just films of them on the internet, drunk out of their mind. 
speaking with vul vulgar language. Darby founded this cult. Don't confuse them with the other brethren, the open brethren. There was a split in the brethren. Darby's cult still exists and is a cult. Why would Spurgeon have warned against him? Why would George Mueller, now you have to understand in Britain where this stuff came from, Spurgeon and Mueller are highly esteemed. They were the primary evangelical luminaries of that era. At that time, Great Britain was still the epicenter of evangelicism, not the United States. It was switching with D.L. Moody over here, but then, then it was still Britain. They warned against him. Full page ads in the news, keep away from him. He's a false teacher, he's a cult leader. Many Adventist cults sprung up at that time out of the Millerite movement. Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, they, they all began it in that general era in the aftermath of the Millerite catastrophe. Darby was a hyper-dispensationalist. What do I mean? If someone was to tell you the epistle of James is part of the Old Testament, it's not for Christians. It's for unsaved Jews. Would you believe it? If someone was to tell you the Sermon on the Mount was for unsaved Jews, it was not for believers in Jesus, would you believe them? This is what Darby taught. How can you say the Sermon on the Mount is not for Christians? Only for Jews. How can you say this largest single pericope encompassing the teaching of Jesus is not for Christians at all, but only for unbelieving Jews? Sermon on the Mount. Well, how an apostolic letter is essentially part of the Old Testament. It's not for Christians. This is what he taught. Spurgeon said he was a false teacher. So did Mueller. So did Newton and other people. James Grant and many of the early brethren people knew he was crazy. He was a despot like any other cult leader. He was despotic. He takes that same hermeneutic. It's not for us. It's only for unbelieving Jews. And applies it to the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 and 25. That's not part of the New Covenant. It's not for Christians. It's not New Testament. That's... It's You must use the hyper-dispensational hermeneutic of Darby to support pre-trib. A cult leader. His American protege, Schofield, a crooked lawyer who was disbarred and sent to federal prison as a swindler. He was a criminally convicted swindler who spent time in the joint. He helped ferment the rise of Bullingerism that was refuted by D.L. Moody in this country. These guys were a pair of scoundrels! A cult leader and a swindler. That's where you got your pre-trip theology. Prove me wrong. Prove Spurgeon wrong. Prove Mueller wrong. Prove Grant wrong. A swindler and a cult leader. The Sermon on the Mount is not for Christians. The epistle of James is part of the Old Testament. It's not for us. They do the same thing with Matthew 24, Luke 21, etc. It's absurd, isn't it? 
I think his name is Andy Wood. There's this guy who actually says, get this, he was on Jan Markell's website, I'm only stating a fact, I'm not attacking, I'm just stating it, that the seven churches in Revelation, no, it's, it's not Andy Who's, it's, it's uh, Randy White, sorry, my apologies. Andy Wood is another pre-trib guy. Randy White, the seven churches in Revelation are written not the seven churches, but the seven future unbelieving Jewish synagogues. On John Markell's website. You understand the insanity of this? Why would you promote somebody like that? This is not ordinary dispensationalism. This is not like uh, Charles Ryrie or Arnold Fruchtenbaum. This is something crazy. But they don't like to talk about it. The same hermeneutic that they say, the epistle of James and the Sermon on the Mount, they're not for Christians. They do the same thing with Matthew 24. Same thing. A cult leader and a swindler. They can't deny it. They just don't like to talk about it. Muslims don't like to talk about Muhammad being a pedophile. Catholics don't like to talk about popes sanctioning the inquisitions. Third thing our pre-trip friends don't like to talk about. Jesus said you will have Philipsis in the world. And he said at the end of the age, there will be a mega Philipson, a great tribulation. Okay. Said that. And it says after the tribulation of those days, he will send his angels to gather the elect, doesn't he? Now this does not mean at the end of the seven years. The tribulation is not the full seven years. On what basis can they say the tribulation is the full seven years? It's divided scripturally into the beginning of birth pangs. Again, back to the obstetric illustration. The beginning of birth pangs. Then, the tribulation. Pushing the baby out. Then is the wrath, the day of the Lord. It is not the full seven years. Where do they get a license to call the whole thing the tribulation? Where? The scripture doesn't support the full seven years being the tribulation. When people say, I'm mid-trib, they usually mean they believe halfway through the seven years. Wait a minute, that, that's, not, that's not, halfway through the seven years is not the mid-trib. Tribulation is not the full seven years. But then, they have to say that the ellipsis equals orge also known as Perezmos. Paul says, we are not appointed unto orge, wrath. In Hebrew, haron yah, the wrath of Yahweh. No, we are not appointed unto wrath. But you will have Philipsis. And at the end of the mega on the great tribulation, he will send the harvesters. On what grounds can they make Philipsis equal orge? None. 
They have no linguistic or theological basis. Thalipsis is thalipsis, and orge is orge. They are not synonyms. How can they grant themselves a license to define the full seven, uh, the, uh, the seven years as the tribulation and to make thalipsis and orge synonyms? We're not appointed unto wrath. We're out of here before the wrath. The faithful church is out of here before the wrath. That's for sure. We're not appointed unto wrath. There's a Syrian section, a global. But there's birth pangs. They don't like to talk about that. How can you make Philipsis equal orge? How can you make tribulation equal wrath? Even in Hebrew, there are different words. Tzorat, at Tekofata Tzorat Yaakov, the time of Jacob's trouble. But wrath is haron, haron. Haron Yah, the wrath of Yahweh. They give themselves a license to make words synonymous which are not and to define the seven years as the tribulation when they have no real basis to do so. In fact, there's a basis not to do so. But they don't like to talk about that. Jesus said plainly, it's after the great tribulation he sends the heart, oh, that's for the Jews. Look, my family are Israeli. My children are born in Galilee. This idea that the church gets the blessings and the Jews get the curses. <laughs> no, the apostate church is as bad as Talmudic Judaism. And the first Christians were Jews and the last Christians will be Jews, according to Romans 11 and Revelation 7. The first believers were Jewish and the last ones are gonna be Jewish. Natural branches get grafted in again. This idea that, the, okay, there's the curse of the law, that's true, Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28. That is true. There is something specific for Israel. And we're not appointed unto wrath. But Jesus said you're going to have tribulation. The words are not synonyms. They don't like to talk about it. On what basis can you make them synonyms? We don't want to talk about that. I love this one. Imminency. Now understand what they mean by imminency. There are no signs of the return of Jesus to be fulfilled. Nothing has to happen. But there's a contradiction in their own theology. If you were to ask most of these people, do you believe that the rebirth of national Israel and the regathering of the Jews to Jerusalem and these things are of prophetic importance? They would have to say in some way, yes. Well, then there are signs of the return of Christ. Oh no, there are no signs of the But wait a minute, Jesus said Jerusalem will be trampled down by the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is completed when they ask what will be the sign of your coming in the close of the age. <laughs> Let us understand what scripture means by the doctrine of imminency. Remember the parable of the wealthy farmer who constructed two barns, remember? I'm gonna store up all this wealth and then I'm gonna retire early. 
And Jesus said, you fool, tonight your soul is required from you. At any moment, I can snuff it or you can snuff it. At any moment, any one of us can check out. Irrespective of when Jesus comes, he can come for any one of us at any time. And we should live our lives accordingly. These people say that if you don't agree with their view of imminency, that the rapture can happen at any time, it's a disincentive to live a moral life. <laughs> no, it's not. The Lord may not come, but he's likely to come for us. <laughs> He's likely to come. I may be here when, when he comes, but if I'm not, the likelihood is he's going to come for me. <laughs> One of the two are going to happen. Either he's going to come or he's going to come for me. Imminency does not depend on the timing of the rapture. It does not depend on it. Nobody's guaranteed anything. You know, I've read stories of, of these health freaks and joggers who ate the health food and running in Central Park and stuff, and they dropped dead when they're 38 and stuff. It's happened. It's happened. I remember a time from New York, I remember a time a guy jumped off the Empire State Building, tried to kill himself, off the 85th floor observatory, and at the right exact second, a gust of wind came and blew him back into the, into the ledge on the 84. It wasn't his time. That same week, somebody known as a good swimmer drowned in Central Park Lake when their rowboat tipped over. Somebody who was a good swimmer drowned in a stupid little rowing lake in Central Park, and they were a good swimmer. Another guy jumps off the Empire State Building and survives. Same week. I'll never forget it. I was a young believer at the time. Imminency does not depend on the timing of the rapture. They don't like to talk about that. Don't you believe Jesus can come at any moment for anybody? Don't you believe that I can die, you can die, we can go to sleep and not wake up? Don't you believe that? Yeah, well, that's imminency, isn't it? We don't know. Then we'll have to talk about that. Well, what else don't they like to talk about? Let's look again at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 13, we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep so that you do not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. Remember, unsaved people die, believers go to sleep. They wake up again, there's no death for a believer. Jesus died our death and gave us his life. Death was rendered inoperative. I was to translate the Greek abolished, but the Greek means it's rendered inoperative. You can push the inflated ball under the water in a swimming pool, but the moment you take your hand off, the law of buoyancy takes over from the law of gravity and it pops out. <laughs> gravity is effectively abolished concerning that ball. Death is effectively abolished concerning the believer. Again, we have teachings explaining this. So, if a believer checks out, don't be overly grieved as those who have no hope. Now look with me, please, to Titus 2.13. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. This is, first of all, a Christological statement. It flatly specifies his deity, doesn't it? It says he's God. It's one of those verses that Jehovah's Witnesses don't like. 
And it doesn't say Jesus Christ, it's Christ Jesus. Remember, Christ Jesus is him in eternity, Jesus Christ is him on earth, I know you know that. Okay. The blessed hope. But the blessed hope is the parousia, his appearance. It is not the harpezo. Did Paul have the blessed hope? Yes. Well, was he raptured? No. Actually, he was raptured in 2 Corinthians, but he came back and checked out. Nero killed him. Did the apostles have the blessed hope? Yeah. Were they raptured? No. All believers for all of history have the blessed hope. It is not the harpezo. It's the return of Christ. On what basis can you make the blessed hope, the rapture? We are told in 1 Thessalonians that those who die in Christ have the same hope. But they don't like to talk about that. Did John Wesley have the blessed hope? Did Charles Spurgeon have the blessed hope? Did D.L. Moody have the blessed hope? Of course. Were they raptured? No. So they hoped in something that failed them. <laughs> no. They hoped in something that doesn't fail. I'm sorry, we need to turn the telephones off of recording, okay? Please turn them off. Where do they get off turning the blessed hope, misdefining the blessed hope as the rapture? In fact, it's a ridiculous statement. That's five. Six. Let he who has wisdom count the number of the beast. This has to do with what we call in Hebrew gematria, and there's a Greek equivalent. But you need wisdom. Christ is our wisdom according to Luke chapter 11. According to Jesus, he's our wisdom. He's the wisdom of God. You need Christ. You need the wisdom of God. In the creation, chokhmah, Proverbs 8. The one at the right hand of the Father creating, that was Jesus. He's the divine personification of wisdom itself. According to Luke eleven forty nine. 49, Jesus defined himself as wisdom incarnate. Wisdom to understand... Six, six, six. Wisdom. Well, that's quite a thing. Well, who's going to count the number of the beast? Who's going to have the wisdom to know it's him? The tribulation saints. If they had wisdom, they wouldn't be here either, would they? <laughs> Once we're out of here, there won't be any question in anybody's mind who the Antichrist is. Even the Jews are going to know they were sold down the river by a false messiah. Unbelieving Israel will know it's been betrayed. 
You have to know who he is before that. Once we're out of here, you won't need any wisdom to know who he is. He's ruling the world effectively. Jesus had three and a half years of public ministry. Satan demands equal time and he gets it through the Antichrist. Up to a certain point within certain parameters. Wisdom. Oh, it's unbelieving Israel. Unsaved Jews? If an unsaved Jew read Isaiah 53, he'd fall on his knees and repent. And I say that as one with a Jewish family. I'm, my family is a mixture of Catholic and Jewish. Two false religions. One a total corruption of the Old Testament, the other of the new. My wife, uh, daughter of Holocaust survivors of children are born in Galilee. My family are Jewish. And I love Israel and the Jews. And I don't like, I don't take delight in what I know is ahead for them. But because of the rejection of their Messiah, something terrible is going to happen. If they knew who he was, they wouldn't make a treaty with them or anything. It's crazy. I don't like to talk about that. Here's my question. Jesus warned about deception perpetrated against the church and against believers four times more than he warned about anything else as a sign of his coming. Wars, rumors of wars, famines, earthquake, pestilence. Oh, we won't be here. Why would Jesus warn believers about something that doesn't concern them? Oh, he's talking to unsaved Jews. They're not going to believe him. 70 A.D. proved they wouldn't believe him, even when these things happened. The second temple was destroyed in 70 A.D., the first one in 585 B.C. Even when Jeremiah was, Jeremiah's a type of Christ, even when Jeremiah, Yemiah Hanavi, was proved right, they still didn't believe him. Even when Jesus was proved right in 70 A.D., they still didn't believe him. The temples were destroyed the same day, the Shabbat it's crazy. The doctrine of the tribulation saints is wildly inflated. Not only most, but nearly all, nearly all, of what the scripture says is going to happen after the rapture and resurrection, after the parousia. Nearly all of it, not all of it, but nearly all of it, indicates that God will turn his purposes back to the salvation of Israel and the Jews in the darkest hour of their history and of human history. Almost everything, look at the book of Revelation, it looks like the Old Testament, doesn't it? It's not written like the rest of the New Testament. It's written in Old Testament apocalyptic like Daniel and Zechariah and things like that. And Ezekiel. Once the faithful church is removed, God's focus is no longer on the church. It's not here. It's no longer on the salvation of the nations. The time of the nations is coming to a close. The time of the Gentiles. God is primarily concerned with the salvation of Israel at that point, the salvation of Gentiles becomes secondary. This doctrine of the tribulation saints is wildly inflated beyond anything Scripture says. Once we're out of here, he's concerned with the salvation of Israel. Jesus fulfills the spring holy days in his first coming on the literal days. 
He fulfills the autumn holy days on the literal days. They're the feasts of Israel. Okay. This will be my next book, No Bomb in Gilead. It's coming out. It's already written. No Bomb in Gilead. Once we're out of here, there's no, there's no way. There's things, once we're out of here, that's it. It's the wrath of God. When he deals with Israel, two-thirds of them are going to be killed. Two-thirds. By the Antichrist and so forth, two-thirds are going to die. There's no bomb in Gilead. Well, the next one. There is no... Absolutely no dispensationalism as they think of it anywhere in the early church or the New Testament. There are two dispensations, the old and the new. That is it. There is a distinction between unbelieving Israel and the church. There's a distinction. And God has a prophetic agenda for both. But it is not dispensational per se. There's only two dispensations, the old and the new. Its opposite is covenant theology. Covenant theology has no basis. Real Calvinists, real Calvinists, I don't just mean the tulip crowd, I mean the people who really believe what Calvin believed. They say God only made two covenants, one, not the old and new, one with Adam and one with Abraham. That's what they believe. Show me, they can't. They do the same thing. They base a doctrine on something not in there. That's a real Calvinist. It was the remonstrance of Dort and those things that re redefined Calvinism by the tulip, but that's not Calvin's theology. Okay. Then there's dispensationalism is the other so-called systematic theology. It is a truth taken too far, a truth that becomes an error. There's two dispensations. Not seven or eight, they don't even agree among themselves. They confuse covenants with dispensations. <laughs> the last one. They don't like to talk about this either. Patristic doctrinal theology. We cannot get our doctrines from anything but the canon of Scripture. But there are other things that are true because Scripture tells us they're true as historical records. The New Testament quotes the Apocrypha. Jesus celebrated Hanukkah, the books of 1st and 2nd Maccabees in John 10. The New Testament Apocrypha, Maccabees in 1st and 2nd Enoch, are they a basis of doctrine? No. Are they biblically important history and literature? Yes, the New Testament confirms it. The prophecies of Daniel are fulfilled historically and recorded in Maccabees, and Jesus observed Hanukkah, the feast of Maccabees in John 10. Jude quotes it. The prophecies of Jesus and Daniel concerning 70 AD are recorded by 
history, Josephus, Wars of the Jews, Antiquities, another book. The narratives in Genesis support the historicity of the book of Jasher. Is the book of Jasher a basis of doctrine? No! Does its historical content help us understand Scripture? Yes! Yes? Now, the post Nicene fathers, the later ones, they were hopeless. They Platonized the church after Constantine pseudo Christianized the Roman Empire. They redefined Christianity as a Platonic religion. I have a very low view of Augustine overall and those who influenced him. I don't have a high view of Augustine or Ambrose of Milan or even of Cyprian of Carthage, theologically. Augustine was right about Pelagianism, there is original sin, but he was wrong about everything else, practically. That's my view. <laughs> However, in the pre-Nicene fathers, we go back to the people who got their doctrine from the generation that got it from the apostles. Hippolytus, Papias, Hagesippus, and above all, Irenaeus, who got it from Polycarp. What did they say? Now understand in his debate with Hank Hanegraaff, the lead debater for the pre-trib research conference in Dallas, the lead debater, again, Dr. Mark Hitchcock, he absolutely, ab he made a monkey out of Hank Hanegraaff, and I'm not saying that to be rude, but that's what he did. And he argued for a Johannine authorship of John, as a late first century apocalyptic revelation to John on Patmos, which again, preterists and other people deny. And most of his argument, or at least much of his argument, was based not on the internal evidence of revelation itself, but on the fact that from Polycarp, Irenaeus said, John wrote this. The early church believed John wrote it during the Domitian persecution on Patmos. Okay. So the pre-trib research council, themselves, their lead debater, lend historical credibility to Irenaeus. And they are correct in doing so. But let's understand what Irenaeus said. Irenaeus made it very clear, beyond dispute, the Antichrist reigns three and a half years. He associated this three and a half years with a number of things, but he also said that John taught the Antichrist would be from the tribe of Dan. Again, in our book, Shadows of the Beast, we talk about the tribe of Dan and why people believe the Antichrist would be a Danite. Okay. Also, that he would reign for three and a half years in Jerusalem. And then there would be a millennium. John taught a literal millennial reign of Jesus for a thousand years. Irenaeus also said the Greek equivalent of Hebrew gematria, isopsophy, the alphanumeric value of the letters, would indicate the name, but he warned about speculating. People were trying to do it with Nero and with Roman emperors and with another of other historical figures at the time. This is 666, this is much like you have now, people have done it with Kissinger and all sorts, haven't they? 
The title of the Pope, Vicarius Christus, Vicar of Christ in Latin, comes to 666. If you translate Vicarius Christus into Greek, it's Antichristus. The papacy is an Antichrist institution, but Irenaeus warned, be careful, do not be dogmatic. Not until the right time will we actually know. He said the best he can see of all that was proposed in his time, his name might be Titan. But he was not dogmatic about even that. He said to be careful. And he said 666. He associated it with the age of Noah. That's 600 years. The early church believed that what happened in the saga of Noah is a picture of what will happen at the end. Remember the Nephilim came down. Now I know there's been all kinds of people with flying saucer conspiracy theories. I'm not talking about that. But angels can appear as men. We can entertain angels unaware. In black necromancy, people have surrogate relationships with Satan as initiation rituals into these terrible things. I know people who are saved out of it, really saved out of it, but they were really in it. Of course, a lot of them are frauds and crackpots, but there are some people who are actually saved out of it. I know a couple of them. And there is this thing of the demonic having a sexual union with humans, leaving their rightful abode, mentioned in Jude. It's also something that happened in the days of Jasher when they came down on Mount Hermon. There's a whole thing about the transfiguration, why it happened there. That is where the Nephilim came down, historic by Jewish history. Irenaeus said that this demonic Enfleshment that happened in the days of Noah will transpire again at the end of the age. You will have demonoids. Now, what would happen if you biogenetically engineer or clone a human being? Where will the soul come from? You understand. This is no longer science fiction. Now, I know there's crazy people saying crazy things. I'm just talking about theological reality and scientific reality. We know a time is coming where they will attempt to clone the DNA of somebody before they die so they can be functionally reincarnated. And people will think it's the reincarnation of that person. Satan will all try to counterfeit the resurrection. You understand? He'll try to counterfeit the resurrection of Jesus. We see what's happening. I don't want to go into it now, but artificial intelligence is going to revolutionize things as much as laptops and desktops and cell phones. What has already happened with cell phones and laptops and desktops, it's going to go to the next strata because of artificial intelligence within 10 years. These technologies, remember, there's nothing wrong with science, but there's something wrong with fallen man. Anything fallen man can use for evil, he will. These things can be used for good. You can clone someone's pancreatic tissue to make insulin. <laughs> You're a diabetic type 2. Okay, it can be used for good. But it will be used, just think of nuclear technology. It will be used for evil. Unless the world is subjected to Christ, it's going to be used for evil. Somehow, what happened with Noah was central to the thinking of the early church. You see this in Jude, you see it in Peter, and you see it in the writings of Irenaeus. A small number of people escaped. He was warning for 120 years, nobody listened to him. God saved his family. The Lord is in the business of saving families, you understand? Just like the Passover is a type of the rapture. They had to eat it as a family. Again, I have the book, Harpeso, we go into these things. But he said, 666 is associated with the 10 horns. 
their belief was the seven heads would be seven religious systems, the ten, ten kingdoms. And they thought that when the Roman Empire collapses, it's the fourth beast, that is what would make the Antichrist come to power, their inability to make the iron stick to the clay. You understand? The inability of, to make the iron stick, you've got people in Ireland who are Celts, people in Poland who are Slavic, people in, in, in Portugal who are, who, who are Latin, and people in Austria who are Germanic. They have nothing in common, culturally, historically, linguistically. In fact, many of them have been enemies historically. Um, the only thing they have in common was pre-Reformation Roman Catholicism. That's why they pushed the ecumenical agenda. It's an artificial way of to gain unity. We've explained this on our various other teachings. Irenaeus believed this, that there'd be a fragmentation of the Roman Empire due to the inability of making iron stick to clay. How are you going to make iron stick to clay? How are you going to make a Polish person and a, and a Portuguese person and a Romanian person and an Irish person? How, how are you going to do that? It's going to, they don't adhere. This chaos will result in a fragmentation. Did you hear of Brexit? <laughs> it's happening already, isn't it? I'm not saying this is it, but it's going that way. It's what Daniel said. Iron does not adhere to clay. These countries want to break up themselves. The Basques don't want to be in Spain. The Basques are Celts. They're cousins of the Welsh and Irish and Scottish. They don't want to be in Spain. The Catalans don't want to be in Spain. Czechoslovakia, Czech and Slovak, they broke up. <laughs> it doesn't work. Iron does not adhere to clay, except in Christ. We can be one because our identity is not based on birth, it's based on second birth. But you understand how the Antichrist spirit works? It tries to counterfeit the unity of the spirit by a combination of economic, political, and religious means but it doesn't work. The only way people can be one is not by birth. Birth will always separate people. It's by second birth only. You can suppress it for a while, but as soon as the Iron Curtain fell, the Serbs and Croats massacred each other. They went back to the wars that they had since the Middle Ages. They turn against, it doesn't work. Germany went back to the ways of the Teutonic tribes under Hitler. It doesn't work. Iron will not stick to clay, but they try to make it. The Antichrist will come and offer a solution. He will try to bring about the unity that only Christ can bring. You understand? Now, the stage is being set for these things as we speak. Irenaeus went on to say, people will be saying peace and safety. This guy will counterfeit the millennium up to a point. Jeremiah says the same thing. Something I taught years ago, and I read Irenaeus, and I almost fell over. I said that the son of perdition, Judas, is the picture of the Antichrist. Now, I wasn't the first one to say that. But what I said, and as far as I knew I was the first one, but I wasn't so enlightened as I thought. I said when Judas pretended to care about the poor, remember? And he seduced the other apostles, could this not have been sold and given to the poor? That the son of perdition is going to use a social gospel, a social justice, the, the Tim Keller type thing, in order to present himself as a wonderful humanitarian. He doesn't care about people, he cares about himself. He's simply playing that card for his own aggrandizement. Again, the, you, you see this now with so-called Christians, buying, evangelicals buying into the Tim Keller agenda. Pseudo-sanctified Marxism or something. Doesn't work. 
but they're going to try. You understand what's happening with, with Tim Keller and these guys who are getting in bed with them. It's going that way. It's the spirit of Antichrist. Brexit, obviously events in the Middle East, it's all going that way. Much more than we have time to talk about now. But let's look at what Irenaeus said. He said this 10, divide 666 by 10. What do you get? Yeah. That's what he said. And he said to take it literally. Don't look for fancy ways of changing numbers or changing spelling. He said people who do that are deceivers. Now remember, he got this stuff from Polycarp. He then wrote, when the church is caught up, there shall be tribulation as has not been since the beginning. One of the reasons we know preterism is rubbish in its normal presentation is worse things have happened to the church and the Jews than 70 AD. It can't possibly be what they say. This has to be something that nothing so terrible happened. What happened in the Bar Kokhba's rebellion in the second century was worse than what happened in 70 AD. The Holocaust of the 1930s and 40s was worse than 70 AD. Worse things have happened to the church, obviously, under the Roman emperors in 70 AD and so forth, and in our own time. Okay, so we got that. But Irenaeus said, when the church is caught up, harpezod, suddenly there shall be tribulation as has not been since the beginning. Some pre-trib people say, you see, he taught pre-trib. He doesn't say it's going to be before then. He says it happens when there's a tribulation. That's all he says. But if you continue reading in his book Against All Heresies, chapter 35, section 1, he says the resurrection of the just comes after the identification of the Antichrist. Hippolytus and Irenaeus both taught. These are people the closest to the apostles. Both taught the Antichrist would have to be identified and persecute Christians before the return of Jesus. The same Irenaeus who Mark Hitchcock, who I like and respect, heralds, in his debate with Hank Hanegraaff, correctly, does not agree with Mark Hitchcock on the timing of the rapture. Irenaeus says, we have to know who the Antichrist is first. And he got his doctrine from John and Polycarp. <laughs> Hippolytus the same. I'm not a fan of Cyprian of Carthage. He was this proto-sacramentalist, but he was martyred. We're talking now 200 to 250 AD, roughly. He said there will be an early departure from the tribulation. You are taken away and delivered from the shipwreck and disasters that are imminent. Worse things are coming after these terrible things begin. In other words, after the church is removed from tribulation, something worse is going to happen. Thalipsis and Orge. Thalipsis is the persecution of the Antichrist. Orge is the judgment of God. You understand? It's going to be much worse. It has to do with the vile judgments and so forth in Revelation. It's much worse. You'll be out of here. You'll be in this, but you'll be out of here. Something worse is coming. We got to get out of here. Something worse is coming. That's what Cyprian taught. Now, he was not as close to the apostles historically as was Irenaeus or Hippolytus. Well, Hippolytus was around 235 AD, but he said the same thing. 
the Antichrist would persecute the church. Irenaeus also linked 666 to Nebuchadnezzar's vision. Now I said that, a number of people did. I arrived at it, I believe, just on my own by the Holy Spirit's illumination, but I was certainly not the first to say it. I discovered others said it, but what really got me was Irenaeus said what I said about Judas, that he was going to be somebody who would pretend to care about the poor and the downtrodden. I was not as spiritual or enlightened. I was right, but I was far from the first to say it. Irenaeus said the first, said the same thing at the end of the first beginning of the second century. And he got his doctrine from John. Well, that's quite a situation. That's quite a situation indeed. Later on, there was a professor of Latin called Cameron Rhodes from an unaccredited seminary, a non-accredited seminary, in other words, not real degrees that I recognize, called Tyndale Theological Seminary. And he propounded the idea that pseudo Ephraim, which some people date as late as the seventh century, but no earlier than the fourth century, taught a preacher of rapture. Well, other scholars associate it with the pseudo Methodius, which is seventh century. But even if Rhodes is right and it's fourth century, that's long after Hippolytus. It's long after Irenaeus. It's long after Cyprian. It's long after Tertullian. All of these guys said the same thing. The early church did not believe the rapture would happen before they knew who the Antichrist was. They don't like to talk about that. They'll talk about Irenaeus saying John wrote it. <laughs> They'll cite him as historically credible when it comes to authorship and date. But let's forget about what he said and believed. <laughs> they don't like to talk about that. And so we have eight things that our pre-tribulational friends don't want to deal with. John Wolverd, their academic patriarch, there's no passage teaching it overtly. It has to be gleaned from other scripture, extrapolated, as T.A. McMahon puts it. John Darby and Cyrus Schofield, one cult leader and one swindler, who Spurgeon and Mueller and others warned about and Grant warned about publicly. Imagine taking out full page ads in the newspaper, uh, warning the public to keep away from this guy. Philipsis does not equal orge. They are not synonyms. Cyprian said, you're gonna have it tough when the rapture happens, when you're rescued, but it's gonna get tougher afterwards. Imminency? <laughs> How can imminency depend on the timing of the rapture when any one of us can give up the ghost at any moment? Holiness and holy living and the incentive to live a moral life does not come from the timing of the rapture. It comes from the fact that we can just croak. <coughs> the blessed hope. They don't like to talk about it. Why not? Because they say it's the rapture. Did the apostles have the blessed hope? Yes. Were they raptured? Nope. So they hoped in something that was a failure to them that failed. <laughs> no. 
Paul makes it very clear in 1 Thessalonians that those who die in Christ have the blessed hope. <laughs> Why would Jesus talk so much about issues such as the identification of the Antichrist and false Christs and false prophets that he warned about more than anything? He warned about that stuff more than catastrophes, natural disasters, deception against the elect, false teachers, false prophets, and false Christ. Why would he warn so much about something that doesn't concern us? Oh, he's warning the Jews. He warned the Jews to believe in him. If you believed Moses, you'd believe me also. There is no dispensationalism found in the early church other than the old covenant and the new. There's two. Yes, there's a distinction between Israel and the church but it's not the dispensational model. Finally, the same church fathers that they will cite themselves in theological arguments and debates for purposes of authorship and dating do not agree with pre-trib. They all said, you have to see who this guy is before it happens. So in conclusion, let's look at it once more. I don't have time to read it in Greek. Let no one in any way deceive you. It will not come. What is it? The antecedent, the episunagage. Will not come unless the apostasy, it's a noun, not a verb, Thomas Ice, and it's apostasia, not epistemi, comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, just like the church fathers closest to the apostles said. The son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so he takes a seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Don't you remember while I was with you, I was telling you these things? <laughs> they forgot. They forgot what they were taught. So is Thomas Ice. So has Andy Wood, so has Jan Markell, so has Randy White, so has J.D. Farrag. They forget what the Word of God taught them. May God open their eyes. And may the Lord keep us faithful until that day. Thank you for listening. We have to end now. I I'll have to postpone the death of cults to tomorrow, but thank you so much for listening. Let's close in prayer. Somebody wanted me to pray in Hebrew. <laughs> They're learning Hebrew and they wanted something. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your goodness and kindness. We thank you for your blessings, for the blood of your Son that cleanses from sin for the cross, and for the eternal truths of your word. Help us, Lord God, to live according to your word, looking for the return of Jesus, for he is coming soon. על ידי ישוע האדון, בשמו נקדמית פללים. 
Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you so much. Hope we see you tomorrow.